Uh, so the title of my talk today is Improving Access to Pre-Emergency Care with Telemedicine and Medication Delivery in Low-Resource Settings. And as mentioned, my name is Eric Nelson. I'm a principal investigator at the University of Florida. And my colleague uh, is Molly Klarman, who's the director of Motomeds um, in Haiti, and she resides on the island of Hispaniola. Uh, this work is supported largely um, over the last six, seven years uh, by the United States uh, National Institutes of Health, and I do not have disclosures to make today. So our challenge is how do we provide a child like this early access to high quality pre-emergency care to avert an emergency? To get at this question, uh, we conducted a needs assessment in 2018 and 2019 in Haiti. And this was done in the form of a healthcare network analysis. And what we found was that families face barriers accessing their intended provider. And those barriers are poverty, geographic isolation, and off hours uh, declaration of illness. When that happens, households pivot to seek care from a non a conventional provider or stay at home and those illnesses might progress to an emergency which forces them to ultimately seek care at the hospital uh, which poses uh, many costs and complications uh, to that. So this exposed an opportunity uh, which was how might we bypass these barriers with some sort of innovative solution to link the household to their intended, in this case, more conventional provider. We reflected on uh, our journeys, and for me, this comes from the field of cholera, which is we felt like whatever solution we worked on must address barriers during acute crisis. So the gentleman shown uh, in Bangladesh in 2006, the gentleman in Haiti in Zimbabwe in 2008, and the father-son uh, pair here in Cite du Soleil in 2010 all have a common story, which is they got sick at home, off hours, didn't have access to consult and also didn't have access to oral rehydration solution. Had they had those two elements, they would likely have averted uh, developing shock and requ requiring more advanced resuscitation. We also felt that the solution must address barriers during chronic crisis. And as shown by the uh, mother on the far left, she lives a life of extreme poverty and there faces many barriers uh, every day um, uh, you know, in her life experience. And so we took her story and did design work both in Bangladesh and in Haiti, worked with a community pharmacist, and after a fair amount of design work over a few years, landed on this idea of nighttime pharmacy delivery service as shown right in now a, an aged picture, uh, which brought us to this idea of a marriage, which was a marriage of telemedicine where you can seek knowledge and mind and then medication delivery and uh, so that you have something in hand. And we proposed this would be a bypass over the barriers that I mentioned. And this takes us to today's talk, which is an introduction to this concept called Motomeds. And I should say that Motomeds is not a company, it's not an entity, it's the brand by which we put forward this idea of telemedicine and medication delivery. And this is the very first group of drivers that uh, we hired. So we began this initiative uh, with a strategic plan, and that plan was really framed around um, a guiding hypothesis, which is that when resources are limited, morbidity and mortality can be effectively reduced at lower cost by facilitating early access to pre-emergency care compared to late access to emergency care alone, especially at night. We framed this work around uh, a series of clinical studies called the Improving Nighttime Access to Care and Treatment Studies, or ENACT. ENACT 1 was the needs assessment I briefly mentioned. ENACT 2 uh, was a pre-pilot of a Motomets prototype for safety, feasibility, and desirability. And ENACT 3 was a pilot of the scaled Motomets model for safety, feasibility, and desirability. And lastly, in Act 4 is an ongoing study of a scaled Motomeds deployment with 
uh, digital clinical decision support software added on in a pre-post study design. So in the pre-pilot, I want you to conceptualize this image uh, shown in the upper part of the slide in which the classical model is one in which ambulances go to households, identify patients, and bring them the centralized resources. In our situation, we're using the same road, but we're operating in the reverse direction in which we're taking centralized resources out to households and then making a critical clinical decision, which is a triage of mild, moderate, severe. And if the case is mild or moderate, we're determining can that case be managed, in this case, overnight um, without seeking uh, more advanced care. So in this first pilot, um, in terms of feasibility and desirability, one element was seeing if we can deliver medications in less than two hours for pre-emergency cases, something we call the silver two hours. From a safety perspective, are the call center assessments accurate compared to in-person assessments at, as the gold standard? And this is really important because we're working on flip phones um, where we don't have video and we don't have great connectivity. So we have to make sure that what we hear on the phone is actually what we would see at the bedside. The general workflow of Motomeds is as follows. We focus on children 10 years of age and younger. Families with sick children call our service from 6 p.m. to 5 in the morning. At the call center, we've adapted the IMCI guidelines. We screen cases for danger signs. Those red cases bypass us and go um, to a higher level of hospital level care. Uh, if the a red case is not identified, we pr proceed to problem specific questions that again have screening for danger signs uh, specific to that problem. If again, there's no red case identified, we proceed to assemble an assessment uh, and plan. And those cases that either don't need medications or live outside the, our delivery zones will receive advice alone. Those that live uh, within our delivery zones and need medications will have a driver with or without a nurse uh, on that, in this case, motorcycle. All cases have at least a 10-day follow-up call um, to establish uh, some core metrics on, on clinical status. So our terrain uh, is difficult. We have formal and informal roads. The one on the left, I would call a formal road. We don't have electricity, address systems, or necessarily clear um, landmarks uh, to go by. We don't have maps, so our drivers have GPS devices on them and they just naturally, uh, by their trade, uh, map our sites over time. And then we have rural kind of more plains to the community as well as really steep mountainous um, uh, regions. So in the ENACT-2 study from September 2019 to January 2021, uh, 347 uh, of our patients out of 391 enrolled had paired uh, call center and household uh, evaluations. Our call length was 20 minutes. Our delivery time was 80 minutes. Our intended deliveries completed was 98%. And our 10-day follow-up completed was 92%. From a clinical perspective, the distribution of complaints is as follows. It's fever, respiratory, skin problems, diarrhea, and shown in blue uh, is a stratification for the chief complaint. Now, an example for how we do our analysis in terms of the call center versus household uh, comparison, I'll use fever as an example. So we found that sensitivity and specificity for fever declared lar largely objectively at the call center compared to the gold standard measurement, the household were 92 and 70% respectively. In regards to distribution of severity of disease, shown on the left is what was determined at the call center, in which green are the mild cases at 83%, moderate is 11%, and that 6%, the severe cases, were referred onwards to a hospital care. Now, amongst those yellow and green cases, uh, we went to those households, and in this, in this ENACT-2 study, every um, uh, household visit was accompanied by a nurse. And what we found was that one out of 50 cases or 2% when we did the in-person evaluation, when we thought that those cases didn't have a danger sign, in fact, had a danger sign. So again, that's one out of 50. 
And so this pairing gives a really powerful um, gold standard uh, to proceed. In terms of clinical status at 10 days, if you add 63 and 32, you get 95% of cases were fully recovered or improved at that 10 day visit. So this was promising and permitted us to move forward and starting to pivot the model towards a more scaled uh, uh, system. So in this case, we wanted to test the question is of if safety could be maintained when mild cases received medication and consult alone without a nurse visit and moderate cases continued to receive medication and consult with an in-person nurse visit. And what that means is that we were proposing to remove nurses from this 83% of the deliveries, and we wanted to monitor safety with that maneuver. The other thing was that we wanted to proceed to a hub and spoke model, uh, which is, in our mindset is critical if you wanna nationalize uh, this sort of uh, endeavor. And so the orange is our call center, the blue is our original uh, delivery zone in Gressier. And then we added a spoke offwards to Okai on the leftward side, uh, which is the third largest city in Haiti. We conducted the study from 2021 to 2022. Uh, we enrolled over a thousand patients. 18% received a nurse visit and delivery. 73% received delivery alone. 5% either lived outside the delivery zone or had something else. Uh, going on, and 4% were, see, um, were referred to the hospital. So to move towards comparison, again, this is the pie chart from ANAC2, in which nurses went to all of the uh, yellow and green cases. And now in ANAC3, we have nurses only going to the yellows. And the distribution of cases in this study is as follows. 76% were green, 20% were yellow, and 4% uh, were red. Again, this is at the level of the call center. So at 10 days, uh, the status of the cases is 97% were either improved or recovered uh, at this 10-day 10, 10 mark. So in addition to these kind of more classical measures of um, outcomes, I want to pivot to something that is probably the most important thing that we're doing in, in Haiti, which is this concept of hope. These are marginalized, poor families in which no one has literally answered their call ever for help. And since we're simply answering the phone, uh, conveys this idea of hope uh, to the community that might be some of the most powerful medication uh, we're providing. In addition, it's been a very challenging many uh, three, four years in Haiti. And during that time, uh, we have done significant capacity building with our call center nurses, our on-call providers, our professionalization of our drivers, um, leadership training for our research coordinator, and multiple of our nurses during this time period have advanced to being uh, nurse practitioners. And then for impact, this story began, was inspired by limitations and failures we had in 2010 in Port-au-Prince. And what's been gratifying for myself is really that what we're doing was inspired by uh, uh, cholera response, but really the impact ex expands beyond uh, cholera and diarrheal disease and also expands beyond that period of acute crisis when you start to pivot into um, chronic crisis. So moving forward into this ENACT-4 uh, study that we have going on right now, there are two specific challenges that, that we need to address. One of which is how do you scale safely? And this is a a drone uh, image I took of Okai and the city's off in the distance there. And the second one is how do we scale efficiently? Which I think is a common challenge to many people in the meeting today. So the objectives of this study is that we're maintaining the hub and two spoke model. And we're asking, can technology increase guideline adherence? Can we decrease training time with technology? Can technology decrease call time and decrease uh, time to delivery? Does cost per patient decrease with scale? And what are the unintended consequences of scaling? So today I've shared uh, the story of Motomeds. Uh, we have a small USAID grant that's funded a deployment in Accra that's led by a colleague of mine, Torben Becker, and an MD-PhD student of his, uh, Katie Flaherty, and partners in Ghana. And I really want to kind of pivot uh, towards the audience, which is, 
if we can ask if there are opportunities to pilot this approach with the WHO GTFCC uh, affiliate. Um, we've chatted about this in the past, um, but I really feel like what we've built is maturing and ready to, to launch uh, beyond the scope of our academic research. If you're interested, uh, please send me an email. I put into the chat box uh, our .org link, as well as my research uh, page link. And there are many, many, many people who have made this possible. Molly Klarman is uh, pictured up here in the upper left. And this is an image of Molly, um, as well as in the middle here, uh, one of our on-call doctors, uh, Lerby Exanthus. Both of them in this moment are teaching the cholera outbreak training and um, shigalosis program, the COTS program, at the College of Medicine in, in Port-au-Prince. Uh, so they are engaged in the cholera field as well. And then this is Yuselin Kajuzma, who's our head nurse who runs uh, the daily operations in Haiti. And then a gentleman, Jason Friesen on the right, who provides a lot of the logistical um, uh, software uh, through a not-for-profit company based here in the US. And I also wanna mention a gentleman, Ben Brintz at the University of Utah, and he and I uh, and other engineers are building software to help give a prediction on, based on the case data, what are the probabilities a patient has green, yellow, or red uh, severity levels. So thank you for your time. I'd be happy to answer questions uh, during the session.